as the war continues to rage between Russia and Ukraine, the, the situation seems to keep expanding as now that we have Vladimir Putin has just uh, finished a state visit with North Korea, uh, which you know, it has a lot of ramifications, not just for the Russia-Ukraine war, but also for regional security in the Asia Pacific and just generally in the among great power competitions. We're going to be talking about some of this and we're breaking down some of the imp implications uh, for American national security and what American interests are. And we have probably the best guy we have on uh, on our show here, Colonel Doug McGregor, CEO of Our Country, Our Choice, uh, highly decorated combat veteran uh, to talk about this. Doug, welcome back to the show. Hey, I'm happy to be here. Well, there is a lot of stuff to talk about here, and, and, and probably not just with the Russia and Ukraine. If we're talking about American interests and things that we need to be aware of, but we'll, uh, let me not get ahead of myself. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I want to talk about uh, Vladimir Putin. <clears throat> last week, uh, last weekend especially, there were kind of a couple of dueling uh, peace proposals, one from Putin where he talked about it, and then one from the Zelensky slash American where they're trying to say, hey, we need to... Uh, you know, have peace on our side. Both sides had kind of maximalist views that seem to be very divergent. But I think when we get into some of the details, one is kind of based, it's harsh, but kind of based in reality. And one is uh, based in fantasy and no reality whatsoever. We're going to get into that. First of all, uh, here's what Putin said when he was in uh, Pyongyang uh, talking about uh, the future. This confrontational policy pursued by the United States to expand its military infrastructure in the region goes hand in hand in the growing scale of military exercises involving South Korea, Japan, and they're clearly hostile with regard to the DPRK. Such steps undermine peace and stability on the peninsula and threaten the security of all the countries in Southeast Asia. Now, what what do you make of that? Because obviously you were in the military for quite a number of years and, and you understand why a lot of exercises happen. Uh, to what extent do some of our exercises that he was referring to there in, in the Indo-Pacific area, especially around both North Korea and China, for that matter, pr contribute to security for the U.S. or take away from? Well, I, that question could be answered pretty easily. I don't think it does much for us at all. But that's not the basis or the rationale for Putin's trip to North Korea. We need to understand that Putin or Russia, let's just say Moscow, has always had the ability to escalate conflict and tensions and crisis with us or anybody else horizontally. What I'm, what I'm saying is that his trip to North Korea is a very clear and unambiguous signal to us that while you are in our backyard in Ukraine, cultivating hostility and hatred towards us, while you have attempted to destroy Russia using Ukrainian forces, uh, and this all happens in the aftermath of the CIA installed puppet government in Kiev, we can do things to you. We can make life miserable for you. And one of those ways is that we can stir trouble, stir the pot in North Korea. He did the same thing essentially when he sent ships and that submarine that surfaced off the coast of Cuba and then moved into the harbor in Cuba. It was another signal that we can, we can escalate horizontally. If you'd like, I think he, he would probably uh, open discussions with the, the Mexican cartels as to what uh, additional kinds of armaments and capabilities Russia could supply to them in Mexico. This is all a part of the same attempt to sober us up, Dan, and get us to understand that what's good for you can be good for us. Don't underestimate our abilities to spread this thing in ways that are antithetical to you because... <clears throat> Let's face it, the war is over in Ukraine. He's won it. He now controls or holds all the key cards. He is in a position now to decide what he wants to do. It doesn't matter what we want him to do. It doesn't matter what we say. It doesn't matter what we threaten. He can do any damn thing now that he wants to do in Ukraine. What he really wants to do is end the war and create a new peaceful stability in Western Ukraine. That can be done but we are not going to support it. And that means that he has to now seriously consider seizing Kiev, 
crossing the Dnieper River, going down to Odessa as the first big stage in ending the conflict, and then secondly, from that standpoint, negotiate with new governments in Europe in the fall. He's not a fool. He knows that European governments are changing. The people that have been ruling in Europe since this uh, insane war began are going to be gone. Now, that doesn't mean they'll all immediately come to Moscow and recognize the utility of ending conflict with Moscow, but I can tell you Berlin is certainly going to move in that direction. And that's probably more important than anything else. And if you look at the most recent polling data that I have from Poland, the Polish people are not just sick of the war, they're sick of millions of Ukrainians being inside their country. They want this thing to end. So their government, which has been a stooge for uh, the European Union and NATO, is about to uh, get an education. And that's what happened with the European elections. All of these, what, what they call far-right parties, which is a joke, these are simply parties that don't want to go to war against Russia and don't want to suffer under the sanctions that we've imposed any longer. They're going to take over. Now, how rapidly can they move? And I think we know from history that you don't, you don't turn off and turn on conflict and crisis the way you do with a light switch, but it's clearly moving in Moscow's favor. That's all. And, and it's, it's interesting. And, and actually, before I move on to the next topic, I want to stick on what you mentioned there, because you said that Russia could uh, move up to and possibly even beyond the Dnieper River. And but of course, we've seen really from the beginning of this year that Russia has been making methodical progress, but it's been pretty incremental uh, other than a couple of big spurts in Avdivka and, and several other places, not far from also from uh, Bakhmut and some of the areas in Kupiansk. Uh, and now a little bit of an incursion up north of uh, Kharkiv. It's continued to go a little bit slow. Do you see Russia either one, just trying to slow methodical to just wear out the entire force? Or do you think that number two, it's actually possible they could make a big punch somewhere? Well, I don't think the somewhere is any question. I, I think they've got 100,000 troops up in white Russia or Belorussia prepared to move from the north to the south on the west side of the Dnieper River down towards Kiev, while at the same time their forces can cross the river anytime they want to. I think he, he was quite sincere in what he recently offered as a potential start point for negotiations, but I don't think he was surprised that everybody rejected them. We're, we're dealing with lightweights in Washington that have made a lot of stupid statements, even dumber than the things coming out of Zelensky's mouth. Now they can't retreat from those earlier policy stances. It's just not possible for them to do that. There are also other things going on that don't really reach us here in the United States. You've got to look carefully for them. German pilots have been scrambling in their jets over the Baltic, intercepting large numbers of, of Russian aircraft from time to time, who've turned off their transponders. So it looks like the Russians are testing the readiness of anybody in NATO to respond to anything they might do in the Baltic. And again, that's another example of what I call horizontal escalation. You know, you, we're all focused on Eastern Ukraine, but what else can the Russians do? And, and that's the point. The Russians can do a lot. And it's very difficult for us being as overstretched as we are to respond effectively. And and so to the second question there, do you do you see any pro prospect that Russia might move quick? Otherwise, it, it could literally be another six months, a, a year maybe before they could move on any of these larger cities. I, I think the Russians would like to end this by the end of September. And if you're going to try and end this conflict before the end of September, you've got to cross the river. Uh, this was the last ditch attempt to avoid that. I mean, this is everybody, you know, you even lied to so much about the Russians yeah. that we don't understand the rationality behind their behavior. The last thing that Vladimir Putin wants to do is rule Ukrainians. He doesn't want to do it. The areas that he's got control of right now are overwhelmingly Russified or Russian. He's not interested in ruling Ukrainians. He wants the Ukrainians to rule themselves. He just wants them to be neutral. Neutral, yeah. And not present a threat to Russia. And that's why he's really trying to create something on the, on the model of the Austrian state treaty because the Austrian state treaty worked. He'd like to see that work in Ukraine as well. And the Europeans are the ones, along with us, that have steadfastly refused that solution, very foolishly, very stupidly. Yeah. That's I, what I wanna, he wants, I, but he, I, he knows he's not going to get that right away. So he's then the other thing is his patience has paid off. Look, everybody that wanted him, and I was one of them, that thought, you know, the biggest mistake you can make 
is not to decisively attack, launch the offensive and end this thing. But he was smarter. And he said, no, we don't need to do that. As long as these Ukrainians will impale themselves on our defenses, let them do it. Well, that's over. Now he's moving incrementally and deliberately towards the West. He's invited as many remaining Ukrainian forces ex as exist that can fight to concentrate in front of his forces near Kharkov. That's happened. Ukrainians just don't have much left. So he can move decisively, but he's still saying, let's wait and see what happens with these governments. And the question is, does he move now or does he move a little later based upon the potential for some of these governments to collapse? Macron's in a lot of trouble. The French government can absolutely change dramatically, but so can the government in Berlin. And he really, really wants to watch what the Germans do. And I read the German media and I'm telling you, the German people are not going to fight Russia and Ukraine. They don't want anything to do with it. And there are large numbers of Germans in the electorate who are saying it's time to, to drop this fiction. It's time to stop listening to Washington. It's time to start acting in the interests of the German nation. And hmm. that's something that Schultz has not done. Yeah, that's, what, a, what an ironic or, or a unique way that is to actually do something in your national interest. Uh, I want to I want to go down a line on something you said a second ago about some of the Western leaders uh, saying lots of dumb things and things that just don't seem to make sense. I'm going to not just show you some of those, but we're going to contrast them because you just talked about how Russia is in the is in the driver's seat on this strategically, operationally, tactically, any way you want to look at it economically. Uh, everything is going in Russia's favor and whether it's quick or later, I, I think it's inevitable that they're going to succeed. Yet, even with that advantage, uh, Vladimir Putin does still seem to be looking deep and willing to make not only so, uh, a negotiated settlement, but also that, hey, we're going to have to have relations. Here's what he said about how he sees things after the war. If Europe wants uh, to remain an independent and the cultural and civilizational centers of international gravity, it needs to maintain a good relationship with Russia. And most importantly, we are ready for that. So, so even all the things that the West has done to, to Russia and, and given weapons and ammunition and fired, allowed their stuff to be fired into Russia and probably helped with some of it, he's still saying that he wants a relationship. He, has to, he knows that they're all living together and they're going to have to have some kind of relationship after the war's over. Well, we are living <clears throat> in the middle or early 20th century in terms of our mentality and thinking. He's living in the contemporary world. He sees no particular value or payoff to conflict and war. He's right. You know, Russia has benefited in many ways from this conflict. It's taken very few casualties. Its economy has grown stronger. It's in a better position than it was when this began, but he's not a fool. War over the long term is too destructive. It harms societies. He wants to get back to some degree of normality. Anyone with any sense needs to understand this. Let me give you a couple of quick examples. In January of 1943, FDR suddenly announced, without having said anything to either the British or the Soviets at the time, that we were demanding unconditional surrender. Churchill, who was by no means a, a shrinking violent, didn't like it. He said, you didn't tell me anything about this. This isn't a good idea. And eventually, Stalin also sent a note and said, we don't want unconditional surrender. That means the war is going to drag on because the Germans won't walk away. He said, we want to end this with Germany. We want to get back to some sort of normal relationship. Remember, this is January of 43. Stalingrad did not surrender until February, 2nd of February, 1943. And even after it surrendered, then the Germans launched a spectacular counteroffensive, did enormous damage to the Soviets, and the Soviets went on to the strategic defense, which worked very well for them, but there was no guarantee that the Germans would be dumb enough to attack them the way the Ukrainians have. It was not a good idea. In 1943, in the fall, Leahy brought in both Eisenhower, excuse me, Leahy brought in both Marshall and Arnold. Marshall was chief of staff of the army. Arnold was the de facto leader of the U.S. Army Air Corps, and he looked at them and said, don't you understand we want to live with the Germans and the Japanese when this war is over? And said, stop annihilating all of these people's cities. 
we were literally bombing the Japanese and the Germans into the Stone Age. He said, it's got to stop. We need a new air strategy. We need a new strategy period to deal with this. Well, at the time, Marshall and Arnold looked at each other. They didn't really understand what Leahy was talking about, but he was making the same point. Today, no one, no one in the West is thinking in those terms. We, we've adopted this uh, Hitlerian solution to everything. Either you agree with me and do what I want you to do, or we're going to annihilate you. Well, that's insane. We are all living on this planet. Putin is not Joseph Stalin. We need to stop behaving like Hitler. This is insane. It needs to stop. But that's where we're headed right now. Putin is holding out the hope for an end to this thing because he really wants to do business with the West. He would like to do business with us. We're the ones who are being absolutely unconditionally hostile. And there's no reason for it. None. Right. And, and so, I, and I think to, to your point exactly there, uh, I wonder if in the context of what you just said in that mentality, I wonder if you can interpret what Putin said when he said, here's what I'm willing to offer. The essence of our proposal is not some kind of temporary truce or suspension of fire, as, for example, the West wants. This is not about freezing the conflict, but about its final completion. And I will say again, as soon as Kiev agrees to a similar course of events proposed today, agrees to the complete withdrawal of its troops from the DPR and LPR in the Zaporozhye and Kherson regions, and really begins this process, we are ready to begin negotiations without delaying them. I repeat, this is our principled position. Neutral, non-aligned, nuclear-free status of Ukraine. It's demilitarization and denazification. So I guess that kind of, I guess, draws the line of what you were talking about, that Putin is, it's a harsh term, but it's realistic. Of course it's realistic. And the areas that he's talking about are not historically Ukrainian. You know, they've been under Russian control. And before they fell under Russian control originally in the 1700s, they were dominated largely by Mongols and Tartars and Turks and the Ottomans. This, this, the regions he's mentioning have been Russian from time immemorial, as far as he's concerned. That means at least since 1776, which is incidentally when we were founded as a country. So I think he's being quite reasonable. But in the West, you, you heard what Bush said. No, under, or not Bush, but uh, Biden. Under no circumstances can we accept this. That's an unjust settlement. Well, to be perfectly blunt, Justice is something that one sees usually in the movies, if they're feel-good movies, but almost nowhere else. The point is that this issue is being decided by force of arms. But again, he wants to end it on what, frankly, are rather generous terms, given the hostility directed at him by Ukraine and the United States and the rest of Europe. How, how much would you it. say, Doug, how much would you say that of his terms that he just mentioned there are non-negotiable requirements or that they're an entry point for a negotiated settlement that he could give if he got something on the other side? Well, I think he's uh, he's left out a couple of things, Dan, that, that historically, you know, he's insisted upon. One is Kharkov and the other is Odessa. He didn't mention Odessa and he didn't mention Kharkov. And the reason he didn't mention them is that I think they may be negotiable. And if I were Ukrainian, I'd be very interested in that. But the, but the key feature of all of this is neutrality, the Austrian-style neutrality. And remember that after Austria was evacuated for many, many years, there was a Soviet general uh, who was assigned to essentially sit in Vienna as a member of the Austrian National Security Council to make sure the Austrians fulfilled all their obligations and commitments. It worked. I think you'd have something similar in Moscow. They would certainly insist on somebody there to ensure that once again, there is no internal coup by the CIA or anybody else to subvert the order and create a newly hostile Ukraine. So I think he's quite serious. It should be taken seriously. It's not going to be taken seriously by Washington because that's an admission of defeat as far as Washington is concerned. Well, but in Europe, that's different. In Berlin and Paris, they can sober up very quickly and they can say, look, we accept these terms. Let's talk about what remains and how we're going to sort this child. I think that could happen. And hopefully you've got some smart politicians. Certainly you've got Le Pen, who if she takes over as prime minister, can turn to Macron and say, it's the will of the French people that we make peace with Russia. And he may well go along with that. At the same time in Berlin, Schultz 
and Baerbock and the other fools that have been running that country now for years, really an extension of Merkel, uh, they've got to go away. And the new regime that comes in needs to say, look, we've got to make peace. This, this war has been catastrophic for Germany, and it has been. Really has been. Uh, but if you're looking for, not you, if anyone is looking to the United States for leadership on that direction, well, here's what the vice president uh, said to dash those hopes. Yesterday, Putin put forward a proposal, but we must speak truth. He is not calling for negotiations. He is calling for surrender. America stands with Ukraine, not out of charity, but because it is in our strategic interest. We stand with delegations from more than 90 nations who also have a strategic interest in a just peace in Ukraine. Among us, no doubt, exists a diverse range of views on many of the global challenges and opportunities we face. We don't always agree. However, regarding Putin's unprovoked, unjustified war against Ukraine, there is unity and solidarity in support of international norms and rules. International norms and rules and unjust and unprovoked, like we didn't do nothing. Nobody in the West did anything. This, this darn Putin just rolled in there. I mean, what you see there, Doug, is not only a repudiation of anything that, that any opening moves that Putin had on there, but then they just said, basically, uh, we're going to keep with the same old things that we've done that have been an utter failure. We're sticking with them. Yeah, I mean, they can't reconcile themselves with reality. It is antithetical to the interests of the American people for us to live in a state of perpetual war with Russia, which is effectively what the Uniparty in Washington is demanding of us, that we live in a perpetual state of war with Russia. No, we don't want to do it. We're not interested in it. Who rules eastern Ukraine has never really been a vital strategic interest for anyone in Washington. And for that matter, virtually everybody that lives in, in Europe, particularly Central East Europe, has no interest in who really rules Eastern Ukraine. For the, for the history of Europe, Kiev uh, was always the outpost of what we would call the West. Everything beyond the Dnieper River and Kiev consisted of Russians, uh, Mongols, and Tartars. You know, we, this is absurd. The other thing is we have no interest in underwriting a, an endless war in the Middle East either, or expanding Israel to swallow its neighbors. This is all nonsense. And we're living in this fantasy world where we think we have the power to impose the outcome. We don't. And if we continue on this path, we'll be at war with everybody. By the way, look at the BRICS. Look at the countries that have now joined, in addition to Saudi Arabia and Iran. And the Saudis and the Iranians are negotiating deals that have to do with natural gas, oil, transport, food, and everything else, looking for a new path from the Indian Ocean all the way up into uh, Moscow. Because again, this goes around Central Asia, which historically has not always been very stable. It's an alternative. And we now know that people are not going to be able to easily transit the Suez. We also know that we've tried to buy off the Egyptians by telling them that we'll forgive their $180 billion debt if they just quietly admit all of these Palestinians who've either been killed or driven out of their homes and let them come into Egypt. But if Sisi does that, he will see be seen in his own country as a traitor, as having betrayed his people, as having betrayed Islam and the House of Islam. That's not going to work. We're, we're holding a losing hand right now. There are at least 50 more countries lined up to join BRICS immediately, and they all want to join this new gold-backed currency system, and they want to get out from under our financial hegemony. So we're not only losing something that we really never completely had, which is global military hegemony, we're also losing our financial hegemony. Yeah. And the financial hegemony was always based on economic strength and prosperity. And that, admitted, admittedly, is very fragile right now here inside the United States. So if anything, we're just becoming isolated. We in Israel are going to end up sitting on the sidelines, watching the rest of the world uh, organize itself and chart a new course. Yeah. We're not going to be in it. And, that and, assumes, and I, of course, that Israel survives. 
I, I, I can't think that the next clip I'm going to show you is going to do anything to stop that downward trend because what you're going to see here is the Secretary of State on this same topic uh, just I mean, there's no better way to say it than it's just dealing with abject non-reality. Check this out. The bottom line is this. Um, the Ukraine strategy that we've had and that we've been acting on uh, individually and collectively now for um, nearly two and a half years uh, is showing effective results. Effective results in making sure that Ukraine can ward off Russian aggression. And it's done that remarkably. Keep in mind, Putin's objective from day one was to erase Ukraine from the map to end its existence as an independent country, to subsume it into Russia. That has failed. To, to say that our strategy has been remarkably successful and then just changing the goalpost by saying, well, Russia was trying to accomplish the eradication of Ukraine, and since Ukraine's still there, they have failed, utterly lies. And it's not a mis mischaracterization. It's an utter lie. He knows that's not what Putin's objective has ever been, but yet he's, he's saying that. And, and just people who don't know, Doug, uh, and that means an American audience, some of them may go, oh, OK, cool, I guess, because they don't know any better. But all that's going to do is continue moving us down an unsustainable path and just going to, I think, lay the foundation for Ukraine eventually being defeated. Well, everybody in the Middle East is tired of listening to Anthony Blinken repeat uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's talking points, all right? Let's put it bluntly. That's the way they view Blinken. So we have no credibility in the Middle East at all. We are simply seen as taking orders from and executing in accordance with Prime Minister Netanyahu's demands. Move to Ukraine. What are we doing? We're telling everyone that we won. Well, there's no evidence for that. The, the terrible condition in Ukraine is evidence for complete and total failure. We have sacrificed close to 600,000 Ukrainian lives on the battlefield, and they continue to lose more every day. How many other Ukrainians have died from other means and, and consequences is anybody's guess. How many millions have now left the country with no intention to ever return again? It's anybody's guess. So the whole thing is an utter and complete fiasco. The American people who have listened to and absorbed an awful lot of lies for a very long time about things are beginning to wake up. The Germans are beginning to wake up. The French are beginning to wake up. I think eventually the Scandinavians, the Dutch, the Austrians, everybody else is going to wake up. There's only one leader in one country right now in Europe that is even remotely connected to public opinion and the electorate's attitudes, and that's Maloney in Italy. And even she repeats the stupidity publicly the difference is that Maloney knows its stupidity, goes back home and does whatever she thinks is right. Whereas the rest of them actually go back home and try to tell people, well, you know, we are winning in Ukraine and we just have to stay the course. No one is marching east in Ukraine. It's over. NATO yeah. is a joke. NATO is falling apart. It's almost as though you have an individual that has uh, some sort of stage four crippling disease but is still able to walk around and put sentences together and says, I'm going to live forever. It's not going to happen. And, and, and Ukraine is even on life support. It's a corpse. It, here's here's a, a, another factor, which just, if there was any credibility left, it's going to be just shredded with this because first you had Blinken saying that this is what it is. And I, and I won't show it to you, but the Stoltenberg echoes the same thing. And Ukraine's still going to be in NATO. They're all getting ready for this NATO summit in Washington next month. But then you have almost 180 degrees out. You have Jake Sullivan saying that we have a very different strategy. Watch this. President Zelensky has made clear, including here in Switzerland, that ultimately this war will have to be determined at the negotiating table. The United States' goal has been to put Ukraine in as strong as possible a position on the battlefield, so it is as in as strong a position as possible at the negotiating table. It's up to Ukraine to decide when and how that occurs. Okay. Its strength at the negotiating table will be improved by what's happened here in Switzerland, because you have more than 100 countries and international organizations coming together to lay a foundation for a just peace built on a simple proposition. You cannot take territory by force. It says that in the United Nations Charter. It's at the core of international law. Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity has to be respected. So, I mean, he's saying we want to help him get a negotiated settlement. Ukraine. Well, if that was the case, we could do it today. 
Putin just laid that uh, foundation out there. Obviously, it was there also in our early 2022. But what, what planet is he living on when you have everybody else? And check this one out from Kirby, by the way, because he's got some really good advice for Vladimir Putin. Look, my response to Mr. Putin is this. If you're so worried about becoming the victim of attacks, and you're worried about your troops' livelihoods and your military units, then get the hell out of Ukraine. You don't have any business being in it in the first place. That's my best advice to Mr. Putin. So where is the American position? You see, it's all over the map. Well, this is a, a new film that probably will come out next year called Frankenstein Returns. And what you've got is uh, a corpse that is playing the role of Ukraine. The corpse is coming to the negotiating table and standing behind the corpse is Dr. Frankenstein, played by Jake Sullivan. And Jake Sullivan is animating the corpse, uh, theoretically, at the negotiating table. This is all absurd. It's dangerous, it's futile, and it's absurd. And the Europeans are beginning to figure it out, as are most Americans. So the bottom line is, it doesn't matter what these people say anymore. And Kirby is playing the role of Igor, the spokesman. <laughs> so you've got Igor speaking on behalf of Dr. Frankenstein. Dr. Frankenstein's animating what's left of the Ukrainian corpse. What's the outcome? Tragedy, disgrace, uh, total destruction. There, the, the thing that's most remarkable about the American government and its allies right now in Europe is the complete absence of any humanity. Yeah. There is no real concern for the people who've been made homeless and been killed off in great numbers in this war because of our policies, because of what we've done, because we allowed someone like Newland to pick and choose who would lead Ukraine, who could be deemed credible in our eyes, who would do whatever we said and would accept the massive billion dollar payoffs in order to keep this war going. This is tragic, but it's a, it's a crime. It's a criminal action. It needs to end. And by the, by the way, the absence of that humanity in Ukraine is matched by the absence of our humanity in the Middle East. Well, it is. And, and, and you've mentioned that a couple of times. And I, and I do want to kind of pivot over to that uh, because it, it, as much as the, what Putin has done in, in North Korea and his, his offer for a negotiated settlement have been making global news, also making global news in the last 12 hours or so uh, has been Benjamin Netanyahu and our response to it. Here's what Netanyahu said yesterday, which uh, kind of caused a bit of a dust up. When Secretary Blinken was recently here in Israel, we had a candid conversation. I said I deeply appreciated the support the U.S. has given Israel from the beginning of the war. But I also said something else. I said it's inconceivable that in the past few months, the administration has been withholding weapons and ammunition to Israel. Israel, America's closest ally, fighting for its life, fighting against Iran and our other common enemies. Secretary Blinken assured me that the administration is working day and night to remove these bottlenecks. I certainly hope that's the case. It should be the case. During World War II, Churchill told the United States, give us the tools, we'll do the job. And I say, give us the tools and we'll finish the job a lot faster. Uh, Gary, do you still have the uh, the KJP uh, response or, or Blinken's response? Is that OK? If you could pull those up when you get a chance, uh, Doug, first of all, I just wonder if you can kind of as you've done with all these other things, kind of uh, pierce through the rhetoric and, and tells the real truth about what's going on. How do you interpret uh, Netanyahu's comments there? When it became obvious on the strategic level that Israel could not annihilate and eliminate Hamas. Uh, Netanyahu and his supporters began casting about for another way to quote unquote win the war. And the way to win this war in their minds strategically is to attack Hezbollah because they know that that's their best shot at widening the war and bringing in the United States on their side, not just against Hezbollah, but also against Iran. And from the very beginning, the obsession with Iran dictated action that would bring Iran to war against Israel. Well, I think Mr. Netanyahu's wishes are being fulfilled right now. He's got an aircraft carrier battle group uh, headed to the Eastern Mediterranean to support him. Uh, I don't know where the Eisenhower is or what its state is, but it went into port after being damaged in some way by the Houthis. But I suspect that they could uh, refurbish the Eisenhower, bring that back out to sea. 
which gives two carrier battle groups with uh, the capability to contribute to Mr. Netanyahu's war. So I think right now, the one thing we can bet on very, very certainly, with great certainty, is a war with Hezbollah. There's no question about it. And Hezbollah says it's ready. It not only says it's ready, but it says it's going to have additional fighters show up to support them. But I think they know uh, that ultimately, when Israel goes after them, it's a war to the finish. There's no question about it. It's even worse than what we've seen, uh, frankly, in Gaza. This is a war that the Israelis know they cannot afford to lose, which inevitably means that Iran will come into the war. Now, I don't know if the Israelis will open hostilities against Hezbollah with the use of a quote-unquote tactical nuclear weapon, but I would not rule it out. They know that the, the Hezbollah is heavily dug in, very well prepared, and has a multitude of weapons that they can hurl at Israel. It could level large parts of Haifa as well as uh, Tel Aviv, where most of the Israelis are now concentrated, because most of the Israelis have left the south, moved further into the center, and the same thing has happened with Israelis living in the north. They've pulled out and moved further into the center, which means these are even more dangerously lucrative targets if Hezbollah responds in an all-out war against the Israelis. And they also know that there's a very high probability that if uh, Hezbollah is in a fight to the finish with the Israelis and Iran comes in, that, Iran, that Russia is not going to allow Iran to be destroyed by us. It will stand by Iran. And then there's something else that's very interesting. It's, it strikes me that very few Americans are looking at Cyprus right now. Cyprus is the unsinkable aircraft carrier in the eastern Mediterranean for Israel. The Greeks have made it very clear, the Greeks control half the island, that those bases will be accessible by the Israelis. Well, as soon as that occurs, I think the Turks are suddenly going to say that's unacceptable to them especially since those bases will be used for strikes against Hezbollah. Then it seems very probable that the Turks will finally dust off their equipment and decide to enter the war. And that's a, that's a, an incredible development that will not necessarily globalize the war, but it will certainly regionalize it yeah. in a way that we have not seen in the past. And, and as Gary just uh, tossed up there, here, here's uh, almost right on cue is a, is a headline in The Guardian that Hezbollah leader has expressly said Cyprus will be a target if it lets Israel use its territory in a conflict. And, and I wonder if you could explain a little bit more for, for some of our viewers who may not understand the direct tie to Turkey and what they may or may not do as a result. Well, years ago in the 1960s, there was a, an intervention in Cyprus. The Turks actually came in and went to war to protect the Turkish population on Cyprus from the Greeks. And I think this is something that Americans should revisit and look at very carefully. We've had some measure of stability on the island, but it's another one of these uh, open sores. It's similar to the arrangements that we've made in the Balkans. We managed to come up with an arrangement that would temporarily cause parties to cease fire but we haven't solved anything. And the Cyprus problem has never really been solved. And so I think this is an opportunity for the Turks to come in and solve the problem in ways that they wanted to do years ago. They were prevented from it by us. And the Turks at that point valued their position in NATO uh, as so much that they wouldn't risk it in an all out war to seize control of Cyprus. But that goes away if the Israelis move in and start using those bases. At the same time, uh, the European Union promised Turkey that at some point it would enter the European Union, but there was never any real intention to admit the Turks to Europe. And with the mass migration of uh, Muslims out of the Middle East and North Africa into Europe, that's even less likely now. So the bottom line is, I think the next step in this war is an all-out war on the part of Israel and Hezbollah against each other the very high probability that Iran will now move into the conflict to support its friends in southern Lebanon, because I don't think they're going to stand by and allow Israel to destroy them. That brings in Russia, and that also opens the door to Turkey. And I think the Russians will tell the Turks, if you want to move on Cyprus, we'll support you, because we understand that's a vital strategic interest for you. You don't want Cyprus to become the aircraft carrier for your enemies. And the Turks are increasingly view, viewing Israel as their enemy. 
Uh, and okay, I, but, but so yeah, Doug, this brings up some some humongous. I mean, I mean, uh, there's geostrategic issues that are just off the charts here, and I'm sure that you're probably going to touch on them in a second. But there's some huge prospects of problems on the tactical and operational level for the United States. We're already into the red in some of our uh, stockpiles of ammunition because we've been given so much to Ukraine. Now we signed a 10 year prospect to allegedly let that turn into a basically a forever war. And Israel's already yelling at us. I mean, that's what Netanyahu was doing because we haven't given enough weapons here on the Hamas. Now, if they open up into Hezbollah, you're talking about a sustained combat that's going to take a lot more rockets, interceptors, artillery, uh, all kinds of other ammunitions, which we don't have. And if you now then you spread that out over a two front war while we're doing Ukraine, Doug, we don't have enough for that. Well, we we've not even addressed the vulnerabilities of the, our forces that are still sitting in the Middle East and the various bases there, which are easy for the Iranians to target. The Iranians have always exercised restraint when they saw that they were walking up to the edge and we would we would do the same thing. We always walked up to the edge, but then we said no because it's really not in the interest of the United States to be at war with Iran. Today, the problem for us is it's not just Iran, it's virtually the whole region that's turning against us. We have no interest that would bring us into war with the Muslim Arabs on the peninsula, as well as Iran, or for that matter, the Turks. Uh, we have no interest whatsoever in that. We have an interest in finding a way to stop this. But here's, here's an important point to keep in mind, and I have to quote John Mearsheimer, who said it very, very well. If our interests and Israel's interests were actually aligned, there would be no requirement or need for a, an Israel lobby. Why is there an Israel lobby pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into people's campaigns and pockets in the hill, on the Hill, in the House, in the Senate, and even in the White House? Because the interests do not align. So they have to be artificially constructed. And that's an artificial construct right now. And I think once the American people discover what's going on, and they'll probably discover after we begin to take losses at sea, there's going to be hell to pay in Washington. No amount of money will ultimately buy off the American electorate. The American electorate is not going to be pleased if we take heavy casualties. And I think that's a real possibility. And again, I go back to Russia doesn't have to engage directly. They can support Iran, and they can also support the Turks. And the Turks are going to be very unhappy about these developments on Cyprus. The Turks are already watching carefully to their uh, eastern border, where the Israelis have been hard at work, as well as we, in inspiring the Kurds to attack Turkey. Why would they do that? Because that's a distraction. That diverts resources in Turkey away from potentially being used against Israel. But it's a rather silly notion, because Turkey is a great power. There are 80 million Turks. They have almost inexhaustible reserves of manpower. The willingness to fight in Turkey against Israel and us is enormous. We, we, you know, you and I talked years ago about the, the Turkish cinema that was turning out films yeah. of Americans attacking in northern Iraq and being defeated by handfuls of Turkish troops who bravely resisted the Americans. These were sellout deals in Turkey. They were immensely popular. We don't have very many friends left in the world. We certainly don't have strategic partners that see this confluence of interest with us anymore. They see us as a catalyst for conflict and crisis. Everything is disintegrating that we touch. So let's look at the, at the, at the tactical or, or even operational look for a moment, uh, because there seems to be this assumption that we can pretty much do whatever we want to do. And uh, if it came to Hezbollah, of course, Israel is going to win that. But Israel fought an inconclusive war in 2006, and since 2006, Hezbollah has been improving its defensive positions to make it much more uh, difficult for Israel to attack into, which is what it would have to do. And Israel has struggled for eight months against an enemy from the Hamas that's just kind of mixed in with the population and inconclusive there. Can Israel, uh, in a, a time-effective and cost-effective way, defeat uh, Hezbollah, and can they simultaneously fight what would then almost certainly continue to spur up in its rear ear? Can they fight a two-front war? Well, I'm, I'm tempted to say no, but I think there's a distinct possibility that the Israelis will use a tactical nuclear weapon, at least one or two, to devastate southern Lebanon. 
what they want to do is drive all of these people north of the Latani River, just as they want to drive the Arabs in Gaza into Egypt or into the desert or kill them. They'll take the same approach with Hezbollah, thinking that they can drive all of the Arabs there north of the Latani or simply kill them. That's why I say this is not going to happen. Others will become involved. The war will spread. Everything escalates. And if they do use a nuclear weapon, then I would say it's almost game over. Anything is possible at that point. The Turks have always known that they could acquire nuclear warheads for their missiles from Pakistan, which has always been on very friendly terms with the Turks. Now, that means you, you end up with a, a nuclear-armed Turkey. There is no reason why the Iranians right now cannot build a nuclear warhead and put it on one of their missiles. They have elected not to do that. There has been a fatwa saying that that would be a sin. But at some point, sinning becomes better than staring Armageddon in the face if the Israelis deliver it to you first. So I, again, I think once you go into Lebanon, this is, this is mana from heaven, so to say, for Mr. Netanyahu, because he thinks then that brings us to his aid. But then you've got to look at us. Where do we stand? How vulnerable are we? What are the reserves of missiles and rockets that you know we've discussed for, for many, many years? And how rapidly can we uh, turn up our industry and have it produce these things in sufficient volume that we can overwhelm an enemy? And I think the answer is it's very unclear that we can do that. We have too many one-offs in terms of uh, missile products and rocket products that take time to build. You know, are we going to get them there very quickly? And where do, we, where do we reload? Whose ports do we use? How are we going to be received? We're lucky that we were able to put into a, a Saudi port. I think it's Jeddah with the Eisenhower. But in the event of such a war, what will the Saudis say to us? Are they going to support us? It seems doubtful. Is anybody down in the South going to support anything that we do against Israel? Unlikely. Where do we stand then with the Italians and the Greeks? Well, the Greeks may well be dragged into the war because of Cyprus. But how much do we have on hand in Greece? Warfare has changed. You know, this is the other thing we've talked about before over and over and over again. And I think, uh, you know, our mutual friend Alex has done an excellent job of explaining what are the needs of modern warfare? Some of them are good old industrial power, scientific industrial production and manufacturing that we don't have. But in addition to that, we don't seem to understand that everything we do is visible. Space-based surveillance eliminates surprise on the strategic and operational levels. It's not there. And that ability is not unique to us. It, the Russians have it. The Iranians have it. The Chinese have it, and the predisposition to share that information in real time is very large. The reason the Ukrainians have held on as long as they have in part is because of the intelligence and information we've provided to them. Right. Now, the Russians have learned how to operate in this environment. We have not. Yeah. And then again, there's a question of do, then, do the Russians and others suddenly decide to disrupt our satellites? And that's kind of a lose-lose for everybody. Yeah. Once you start destroying satellites, everybody's satellites can go away. Are we prepared to operate without the aid of those satellites? Yeah, we're definitely not. Uh, and I don't know about Russia. Some some countries I know are, but we're we're definitely not. Uh, so let me ask you two questions, Doug, one at a time. Uh, first of all, I, I want to ask you what we should do, given that the team we've got in place, and we don't get to wish somebody better was out there. We have what we have. We have Kamala Harris, Biden. Kirby, uh, you know, Secretary Austin, et cetera, given what we have, what should we do right now to avoid this catastrophic outcome? The Soviets used uh, a concept which was really developed by Lenin many, many years ago. It was called the correlation of forces. And they would simply look at a, a country and they would say, how much can this country produce in terms of food, spare parts, military power, and so forth. Then they would say, how much manpower can it produce? Then where is it? What's its proximity to us? This is how they would calculate the potential for other nations to threaten them. Then they would also look at themselves and say, given where we are and what we've got, what is the correlation of forces for us? Where do we stand? And then they would match these things. 
and say, on one hand, we have, you know, this combination of capability and forces, not just military, but also social, societal, cohesion, uh, political, diplomatic, industrial, economic, scientific, technological, all of those things. And then the opponent has these things. Now, you've heard Putin say many times, very truthfully, that if you look at the NATO alliance collectively, it has the capability to defeat us, the, the Russians. But there's a problem. NATO is never being united. NATO does not have a, a unified military command structure. NATO forces do not all obey orders from one source. They all have national authorities over them. And NATO has not exploited its military potential, either scientifically, technologically, industrially, or in terms of manpower. Ergo, if you look at the coalition of, correlation of forces, it favors Russia, not NATO and not us. If you go into the Middle East, you have to ask the question, what is, what is the correlation of forces for Israel versus everyone else? Well, versus everyone else, it doesn't look very good. And then the question is, how much can we compensate? How much can we bring to the fight? Well, you and I know that the United States Army is in ruins. It can't do a damn thing. And now we've seen the Russians who have clearly made it obvious that they can escalate horizontally. In other words, they're going to start fires elsewhere that divert our resources, our attention, and our capabilities. And then finally, you have to ask the question about national will and resolve to do anything. What are we resolved to do right now? Congress may be resolved to do lots of things that makes it money. In other words, if it enriches them, yeah. sure, I'll vote that way. You want me to uh, vote this way because the Koch brothers and their friends are providing cash because they want to do things with oil and gas and coal and others? That's fine. I'll vote that way. Oh, the Israelis, they want to go to war with their neighbors? Sure. I, pay me, get me elected, and I'll support that. Until suddenly somebody realizes the yeah. correlation of forces isn't good. We could actually lose. Yes, and this is what nobody really wants to face. And so everybody talks as though it's 1991, Dan. Right. And it's not 1991. Right. Those days are over. We squandered all of the advantages and assets that we had. I'm not saying we should have stayed in a state of war with everybody since 1991. That's not my point. But we did not build anything new. Why are yeah. we running around in tanks that were designed in the 1970s for use in the 1980s? Why didn't we fix the engines? What are we doing using Patriot missiles and missile batteries and radars that were designed in the 70s for use in the 80s even now? Why haven't we massively improved and updated and modernized? Because we never did the things along the lines of downsizing and reorganization to extract savings in order to do that. No, we fed the beast. And the beast said, send me what I always do. Give me money and I'll give you back what I always produce. Why do we have ships that are simply irrelevant? Because they're no longer equipped or designed to deal with a very different strategic very environment. Different. It could go on yeah. and on. But the point is the correlation of forces right now, when you start adding them up, don't look good for us. They don't. So if you add those up, really. then that leads to a conclusion, what we should do. So what should we do? And then we're going to talk about what we will do. Well, the you know previous presidents, I think, would have intervened and said, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, that's far enough. This isn't working. You're headed down the wrong path in Gaza. We need to stop this and work out a solution. We need to sit down with other people in the region. And of course, that's something the Israelis don't want to do. The Israelis don't want to become another nation in the region. They want right. to be the supreme power. But that's what Presidents in the past have reined things in. He's complaining about shortfalls in equipment. I'm sure some of that, or munitions, some of that is deliberate, but most of it, I think, is also a function of what have we got? And how much of it do we give away to the point where we have nothing left? The Europeans are already confronting that. We've confronted that to some extent in eastern Ukraine. So there's more going on there than I think he's aware and he's making his demands known because that's a warning for all of the handlers on the Hill that work for the lobby to say, you need to step up the pressure and give us everything we want. I don't know that that's going to work. Uh, I think no. people are going to begin to question the wisdom of that. But to date, they haven't done it. So let me ask you this. G given the way. And by the way, uh, we haven't talked about what should happen with Moscow. 
anyone, right. anyone who's remotely sane at this point would say, stop everything. Stop the press. We need to meet and sort this out as quickly as possible. Europe is dying economically in large part because of our sanctions and what we've dragged them into against Russia and even now China, which is insane. So we, we, we need to stop. No one's going to do Couldn't that. agree with you more. No one is but, going uh, to do that. Uh, let's see. I, I don't think I actually showed this. Given how our leaders have responded to Netanyahu, you had, uh, Gary, do you have KJP or is that one we pulled up? Okay. Here's what KJP said. So this is the official spokesman for the White House after Netanyahu just humiliated us publicly, responded with this. Has the administration been withholding weapons and ammunition for months, like Netanyahu seems to be so, saying? Let me just start off by saying that we generally do not know what he's talking about. Uh, we just don't. A couple of things that I do want to add, and you're right, there was one particular uh, shipment of munitions that was paused, and you've heard us talk about that many times. We continue. We continue to have these constructive conference discussions with is Israelis for the release of that particular uh, um, uh, shipment that I just mentioned, and don't have any updates on that. Uh, there are no other pauses, none, no other pauses or holds in place. Everything else is moving in due process. That is coming from uh, Secretary Blinken. You heard directly from him earlier. So I, I, I could show you Blinken, but I'm not going to waste your time doing it because you know what he's going to have said. But given this kind of reaction, when, when Netanyahu makes that kind of a claim, what do you think the chances are that Netanyahu will calculate that I can start a war in Lebanon, even though I, I even though I don't get the green light from, from the White House and they're going to support me anyway? They would never just leave him hanging out to dry so we could get drawn into this war, whether we want to or not, even though. Uh, Israel by itself doesn't have the capacity to wage a war with Lebanon. How do you see that playing out? Uh, I guess the answer to all of your questions is yes, yes, and yes. I think they're probably laughing. I mean, I, I couldn't stop laughing if I were an Israeli leader at this point, watching this Jean-Pierre uh, say, oh, we're doing everything we can. Please don't be angry with us. We support you and we'll, we'll find a way to make this happen. Almost apologizing. Oh. Yeah. Oh, please, please support us. Uh, you know, uh, everybody, what is everybody worried about right now? Sadly, most people aren't really focused on what's happening in the Middle East or Ukraine and Washington. They don't expect that anything bad could happen. And they don't think what's happened in Ukraine is all that big a deal. What are they worried about? The election. And, well, please send us money. That's what it's all about. It's a disgrace. Any American with a, any amount of real genitalia, let me put it this way, should stand up and vomit all over these people. This is right. the United States. Right. I, I've never heard anything like it. I can't imagine Eisenhower putting up with that crap exactly for what I was thinking. 10 seconds. I don't think JFK would. I don't think Nixon would have. Even LBJ, who was a huge disappointment, never knew what the hell he was doing in foreign policy. I don't think he'd have gone along with that. It's incomprehensible to me. The whole thing is, is, is just nuts on steroids. But that's where we are. That's what the Americans have for government. And I hope Americans watch it and listen carefully. But I'm afraid that's not happening. They're too busy worrying about Taylor Swift and her, her new boyfriend and whether or not they're going to get married and who's ultimately going to win the game on Monday night and can I go get a case of beer. And if I can get a case of beer... And I can watch the game and I can pay the mortgage on my house. I don't care. Right. That's the problem. So, so, so we just talked about what, what should happen. We should wind this down. We should tell Netanyahu to shut the hell up and you're not going to get anything if you'd go after things that are uh, antithetical to American interest and the same thing in, in the Ukraine. But now let me ask you, what do you think will happen? Well, let, let me use an historic example, even though this is probably not easily understood by many Americans, but I think it's a good one. In 1813, uh, Metternich, the, the foreign minister of Austria, who was ostensibly Mr. Kissinger's idol or model, met with Napoleon Bonaparte, who was the son-in-law, of course, of the Emperor of Austria. 
And Napoleon had recovered brilliantly from his losses in Russia. He defeated the Russians, the Prussians, and the Swedes. And so he came to Bonaparte and said, we have an agreement here, a deal for you. You can keep the Confederation of the Rhine. I won't go into detail, but you can keep all these things in Italy and so forth. But we have to have peace. Europe needs peace. Too many people have died. Everyone wants peace. Everyone will live with this. This is the best deal you're ever going to get. And Bonaparte turned him down and said, no, I'm the greatest. I can defeat you. No one can stand against me. So 600,000 uh, troops from Austria suddenly joined the coalition with Russia, Prussia, and Sweden. And we know the rest of the story. They crushed Bonaparte. They invaded and occupied France. It was the end of it. Bonaparte came back, but it was a joke. It lasted 100 days and it was over. The point is, that's the sort of situation we're in right now with Putin. He holds the cards. Let's admit it. Let's be done with this. It, the people in the region need peace. The Europeans need peace. They need economic prosperity. Let them sort themselves out. Put an end to this and turn to the Middle East and say enough is enough. Don't do anything. Cease fire on Lebanon. Stop what you're doing. Let us hold a summit. Let us talk to everybody with an interest in this thing and see what we can sort out. Because if you don't do it, you, Mr. Netanyahu, and your country may not survive. And that has always been my greatest fear, that they've overreached. And their yeah. overreach is based on unrealistic assumptions about us and about their enemies. Yeah, and I, 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 do, I do fear that I, I think Netanyahu is just blinded with rage, uh, blinded with ambition that this is the time that he thinks he can get away with everything. And so far, he's being proven right, but that he also thinks he can accomplish anything. And, and I think he is vastly underrating the threat of a regional war. Uh, against him that should never, ever have happened. But uh, we'll just have to wait and see how that stuff plays out. You very clearly laid out what we should do. Uh, I fear that nobody in Washington uh, has the courage and the backbone to do it, but we'll wait and see how it turns out here. Uh, thank you so much for coming on today, Doug. These are these are pretty tough situations here and really great for you to just parse it out and show what's really at stake in both the Russia-European uh, war and, as well as the, the uh, Middle Eastern wars. Well, re remember, Dan, this is all happening against the backdrop of our open borders, our rising crime rates, millions of people pouring in, more than 52 million people in our country today who were not born here. And no one's paying attention. No one in Washington cares. They're, they're interested in things that are external to us that frankly aren't that important to us. They're becoming very important now because they will be, yeah. destroy our position in the world. But the point is what happens here is decisive. How much longer do we have in America? That's the real question given the immigration. That is the real question. And, and given your position there at uh, our country, our choice, uh, anything new going on with you? Uh, what's uh, what's, yeah, what's there, there, there is a, there? there's a new platform. It's not it's not an OCOC platform. It's uh, being fielded by One Truth Media and One Truth Media is billing it as a free speech platform that uh, everyone and anyone can use. Obviously, the one requirement uh, is that the people that use it should love the United States. Obviously, if they don't love the United States and they're on there just to tear it down, then they'll be asked to go away. But otherwise, it's it's free speech. Anybody can go on there and use it, and you'll have lots of actions that you can take. You'll be able to go to this and discover everybody that is in your county, in your town, in your city, in your state, and at the at the national level that has authority over over you. You can find out who was elected and who was appointed. And if you don't like something, you can send them a message. You can organize others to do the same thing. You can write whatever you want. I mean, hopefully with very few expletives, but you can write what you want and say what you want. This is this is idea is to sort of get people to the point where they can make an impact. They have yeah. some influence. So they're not simply standing there saying, well, what can I do? This is a, a platform that gives you something that you can do. Uh, we're calling it Mission Control for Operation Save America. I like the sound of that a lot. <laughs>
Well, so. we'll definitely support that here because we we often uh, get into situations where we we tell people to take some action, and uh, oftentimes people don't know wh- how to take action or where. So this is something that we'd be happy to to uh, foster here, and and so that they get a chance to do that. We're launching on the fourth of July, and uh, we hope that this trajectory is going to go straight up. Uh, it's not something that is launched and then stagnates. This is something that's going to launch and build and expand and extend. Well, we'll certainly hope so. Uh, I, I remember a month or so ago, you were talking about a, a possible bus tour of, of doing some stuff with uh, veterans. Is uh, any movement on that for the summer? Well, we've poured all of our resources into this platform right now. Uh, that's number one. We want to get that off the ground because we think it's going to be very, very helpful to people uh, during elections. Because if you're a politician and you're an in- independent, you're running for office, you don't have big money. Get on this platform. This will allow you to talk to everybody. If you're in the state of Iowa and uh, you're in Boise and you're running for office and you have no money, get on this platform. Tell people what you think. Post your videos. Post your platform. You will reach people. That's why we built this thing. It's for people that don't have the resources that the big donors provide. We're tired of big donors winning elections. Yeah, well, that sounds great, Doug. I, I'm really excited about that, and I, and I do anything that can put power in regular Americans' hands, especially if we can build some numbers up to to you know cause the the people that do have the power to take notice. Man, I'm all for that. Yeah, that's that's the goal. Thanks. Well, man. that's awesome, and we will definitely uh, promote that here on this channel once it does go live, and and then give those tools into the, the folks that watch our show as well. Uh, yeah. and, and listen, we are so grateful for to have you on today, Doug. Thanks a lot for all of this stuff. And we thank you guys for joining us too. Uh, And and I say this so many times, folks, but you just don't get clear-eyed information like this anywhere else. Uh, Certainly not on any mainstream media. Take this and expand it out. Do what Doug was saying with the resources that you have available right now. Send this video to anybody that you know that needs the truth, that just gets a one-dimensional view from from some of the mainstream media or just these quotes with no context from some of these senior people. Send them this stuff so they see there is some real substance behind this, and the, the situation is much more alarming for our own national interest than a lot of people are telling you. And we're going to continue to bring that stuff, folks, because you know we are unintimidated and uncompromised to bring you the truth. And we're going to keep doing that. And we will see you on the next episode of Daniel Davis Deep Dive.